I'm really delighted to be able to um, celebrate today the uh, news that the Institute of Education has been um, announced as number one in the world for education for what is now the fifth year in succession. Um, that's an amazing achievement and we're all highly, highly delighted about that. So first of all, I think uh, thanks must go to our staff. Secondly, of course, our students are key to this. We are really privileged in having fantastic students um, at the IOE. Um, students that uh, come from all around the world, all continents of the world, as well, of course, as from the UK itself. Thirdly, um, that extends into our alumni. Um, we have a very active alumni um, network um, which stretches back through our history um, and they come together in a variety of ways um, to support uh, our work and to stay involved. And as we become an increasingly international and outward facing institution, it's really lovely to see how our alumni are working in countries all around the world and um, are staying in touch with us and making sure that the work of the Institute of Education is reaching out and that their, their work that they're undertaking now is reaching back into the Institute. I'd also like to, to thank um, our various partners, um, which includes our funders. Um, we have a very, very large research um, portfolio here at the Institute, which is supported by um, very diverse sets of funders. Uh, including major research councils, major charities, um, European and international funders. And the critical mass of researchers at the IOE are interested in is social mobility and social justice. Um, and a, a couple of examples, John Jerram um, has been doing some extremely influential research on the attainment gap, um, really looking in forensic detail at, um, at data which shows that the gap between uh, young people's attainment is still very much linked to their start in life, their social background, their socio-economic uh, status and, um, and so on. And that's really important because it reminds us that it's not just about the quality of education in the classroom that leads to the results at the end of the day, it's also about um, the kind of society that we're living in. Um, so that's very important research. Um, perhaps specifically and, and relatedly, we've been very engaged in uh, policy debates about uh, grammar school systems and the extent to which those support social mobility or limit social mobility. And I think the evidence they've brought forth has had a major influence so far on, on government policy and in cautioning them um, on the idea of expanding grammar schools. Um, I'd also like to draw attention to the work of our Lakes um, Research Centre. That's a res major research centre that's funded by the ESRC. And what they've been able to show is that there's a, um, a, a continuing impact which relates to the quality of the school system and the immediate post-school systems of uh, initial vocational education and training and the later attainments um, and um, outcomes for individuals. Um, and um, it's highlighted that the uh, UK has some way to go to be as successful as the best countries in uh, the, the longer term outcomes of our education systems. Um, I'd also like to highlight the work of the Centre for Global Higher Education, which is led by Simon Marginson. That work is really, I think, leading debates on higher education as an area of international policy interest. There are um, uh, extremely lively debates at the moment across the world about higher education. It's expanded enormously across the world um, and in developing countries as well as developed countries. And the question marks about how long that expansion can uh, be maintained, sustained, how it's funded, how it's resourced, and what the implications are if more young people and, uh, and people through the life course have higher education. We also are, I think, um, beginning to lead the way now in terms of the debate about the impact of artificial intelligence on education. Rose Luckin um, is a leading scholar in this area and has got a number of projects working with edtech companies um, and with other stakeholders looking at the implications of AI for education. And then finally perhaps I'd like to mention our research centre on autism education. Um, that um, centre is doing uh, amazing work with um, working with people with autism, again reminding us about the importance of collaboration and partnership with our, with our um, 
uh, uh, partners, our, our bene potential beneficiaries. And, and recently there's been some really interesting work which has identified that um, people with autism actually have better sound detection than people without autism. One of the areas that we are very excited about in terms of future developments uh, over the last few months, which is a series of public debates which we're calling the What If Debates. We're delighted that the Times Education Supplement has come on board with us to partner in, in, in uh, providing those debates. And the purpose of those is to identify really hot um, and controversial topics within education policy um, and which we believe that research can inform um, and to debate those with um, a panel of experts both from the policy and practice communities but also the research communities in front of a live audience um, and then to connect that to social media and I think it helps to um, sensitise us to what the issues are of key concern in education that we may already be researching, but which we may want to be thinking about um, identifying further research questions that our uh, uh, academics can be focusing on. So it's a really productive way of uh, developing an engagement between the research that's happening on the ground, the academic questions, and the scholarship which is going on, and the communities um, and debates which we want to influence and play a part in contributing to.